Welcome, everyone. I am Angelo Robles to the Angelo Robles podcast. I'm also the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. We have a great session today and a topic that I haven't covered in a while. And obviously, it's going to be very timely when you hear the title, and that is COVID-19, Biotech-Related Investment Opportunities. It features a returned visit from Dr. Sanjay Patel, who besides being an acclaimed cardiologist doctor, is a chairman or is the chairman of Accelera Health. So let me give a little bit of context to today. One, and timing's important, we're early mid-December at the moment. We did have Dr. Patel on back in June and things are very, very different now. On perhaps a bit of a good front, treatments have gotten better. And as we know, several vaccines are well, I was gonna use the word approved, but let's say incredibly close uh, to moving forward here in the United States. So that's gonna be the good news. So we're gonna get an update from someone like Dr. Patel, who's very knowledgeable for obvious reasons about that topic. But what makes today a little different, and it's in the title, Biotech Related Investment Opportunities, is his company's doing amazing things. And there are opportunities to invest in biotech, which is again, everything is being accelerated because of COVID. And that opportunity could be significant for investors and family offices. So from his perspective, we're gonna hear a lot about it. So on that note, Sanjay, I'm gonna really turn over the reins to you to give us the overview and cue us up into the presentation. And then I'll come back towards the end and engage with questions. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Angelo. Um, thank you for having myself as well as my team back on this particular topic. Uh, as, uh, as you described, Angelo, back in June, it was very, very different. Uh, the curve had, at least uh, to many, seemed to have been flattened. The worst of the first quarter of the pandemic in the United States uh, seemed to have been waning. And unfortunately, we're two quarters later and we're on an accelerated sweep going up. Unfortunately, it's, it's going up and it has all of the appearances of being uh, much worse than the first phase. The, the first round was pretty bad. This next round uh, has, despite all the advances in both treatment, identification, uh, management, quarantine, all of those things, there's every possibility that this could be significantly worse than the first quarter of 2020. So without uh, further ado here, I'll just uh, share a screen. Let's make sure we can do this. And there we go. All right. Are we seeing the title slide? I'm, I apologize for the confusion. But we I, are. Perfect. It looks beautiful. All right. Well, for those of you who I'm having the opportunity to present to for the first time, uh, we've got a little bit of an agenda here. I represent Accelera. Accelera Healthcare is an, an integrated delivery system that is really uh, focused on technology, advanced analytics in the form of AI, as well as the use of genomics and specifically targeted drug development. Our mission is essentially to deliver high quality, precise medical care at the lowest possible cost. In other words, sustainable, no longer in the old model of just continue to charge whatever the system will support and continue to consume ad nauseum. That's really what our fundamental differentiator is, is to leverage both technology as well as the data inherent in the human genome and tie that together with therapeutic agents, particularly various types of drugs. We are a holding company model. We have a Medicare HMO. We have a genomics initiative. We have a pharmaceutical manufacturing, a pharmacy benefits manager, a medical group, and a technology component. So we really are more than just one company, Accelera is the holding company, and then we have several subs underneath that. It's kind of ironic because at, before the pandemic actually hit the United States, 
uh, we had really looked at discovery genomics as a mechanism to really advance knowledge in oncology as well as in pharmacogenetics. In other words, if you're on medications, which medications are the best ones for you? If you develop a cancer of some kind, what is unique to you as a person and unique to your tumor type that we can actually elucidate in terms of information so that we can develop the best treatment protocol for you. The other piece was Accelera Pharma and the PBM. These go hand in hand in terms of the delivery of medications, not only for acute conditions, but for chronic illness, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, and the like. Those things that you've got to take medications for the rest of your life, essentially. These are all instantiated based on the technology that we've developed in the workflow uh, with regard to artificial intelligence and predictive analytics. Not going to bore you with the details about that. Let's talk about the, the issue at hand, COVID-19. You know, early on, there were several different scenarios. If you look at the slide, there were several possible scenarios, a, a peak here in early 2020, and then a series of waves, right? Sort of like a pebble thrown in a pond and then the ripple effect. The other possibility is that we're just going to have a whole bunch of peaks and it would be sort of flattened out. <clears throat> what we appear to be seeing is, is this scenario too, wherein in early 2020, we saw that peak when the virus hit it will eventually even out into a seasonal sort of model, but it looks like the worst is about to come over the next four to six months. And of course, it's not going to be gone. Even in 2022, we're likely to see it despite the vaccine. We'll talk a little bit about why we believe that this is going to last at least to the end of 2022 and potentially beyond, even with multiple vaccines available. So the world needs a solution to this monster that is coronavirus, COVID-19. It has always been a solution that is not one single silver bullet. It's a combination. If you think PICT, like picture, it's a multi-pronged approach, prevention, identification, containment, and treatment. Up until this point, prevention really consisted of shelter in place or, or self quarantine, if you will, for lack of a better term, don't go out, don't interact with anyone, wash your hands, socially distance and wear your masks. I won't actually address the debate about whether mask wearing is helpful or not. Let's just be pragmatic, take away, you know, any other notion political or otherwise wearing masks, reduces the number of particles that come from an infected individual out. Wearing masks reduces the number of particles that an uninfected individual inhales. You can argue how much and how many particles and how effective, but it's really very simple, right? If you're in a forest fire, you, you see people wet a cloth and put it over and try and breathe. Why do they do that? Is it going to give them more oxygen? Of course not. It's simply to reduce the number of particles, particulate matter that gets inhaled. So it's a very, very simple model. And I really don't want to, you know, get into the debate about mask wearing because it seems to be in, in some venues somewhat controversial, but at, at its very simplest, it's a very inexpensive mechanism to reduce transmission. It's that simple. Identification. <clears throat> this is much better, but continues to be an issue. What is identification? It's determining who's positive. Early on, we did not have a good testing infrastructure, and that is why the pandemic was as bad as it was. We have an improved testing infrastructure, but it's still insufficient for what this next wave looks like it'll be. What does that mean? There are multiple different tests. I not a week goes by when someone announces some new technology that is rapid and inexpensive and you know is able to identify COVID-19. Let's let's 
be pragmatic. The gold standard is still the PCR test. What does that mean? If you have a PCR test for COVID-19 that is highly sensitive and highly specific with a low limit of detection, you have quite a bit of confidence that a positive is a true positive and quite a bit of confidence that a negative is a true negative. Antigen testing, uh, several other variants of, of uh, identification of the virus, if they don't have the same sensitivity and specificity and low limit of detection, you're not going to detect the virus in every, you know, in, in almost every instance. What does that mean? Someone can tell you you're negative and you're really not. That has obviously dramatic implications uh, from the standpoint of disease transmission. We do have improved testing capability and that will continue to improve. But again, the gold standard is the PCR test. The rapid tests that we've heard so much about in the news, you hear about this, this new test that's you know five minutes, uh, I'm sorry, $5 and can be done in 15 minutes. The issue is scale. <clears throat> if a machine is able to do provide a 15 minute result, how many of those can it perform within a single shift? That that's really what the issue is. So although it is helpful, it does not open up stadiums. It does not open up all these venues that we used to have available to us for public discourse and, and congregation. Not yet anyway. The technology is evolving. Containment. When you isolate someone who has been identified as positive, today our only mechanism for containment is to have them quarantine. And once they actually quarantine, they are essentially not communicating or interacting with other people for anywhere between seven and 14 days. The pragmatic reality is there's a blanket statement. It was 14 days of quarantine. That's now being abbreviated to seven days. That doesn't necessarily cover everyone who is infectious. That's the problem. Some people are not infectious within five days. Some people are still infectious at 25 days. So that's a serious issue. And last but not least is treatment. Up until this point, we have not had effective treatment that is usable in the outpatient setting that reduces not only the duration of symptoms, but more importantly, the duration of infectiousness. In other words, if I can give you something that you can take orally and within five to seven days render you non-infectious with a 90% degree of certainty, that would really change the trajectory of the pandemic. That would change it very, very dramatically. And we'll, we'll get into some of those right now. Of course, we have Gilead's drug, Remdesivir. Uh, we now have evidence that hydroxychloroquine doesn't seem to really have a significant effect. We do know that in severely ill patients on the ventilator, that dexamethasone, also known as Decadron, seems to improve outcomes. In other words, fewer people die when they're put on Decadron because of the inflammation, the body's inflammatory response that gets created. So, uh, you know, treatments up until this point have been limited to largely IV and really very much, very little in the way of prophylaxis and nothing in the way of outpatient oral treatment, at least in the United States. Let's talk about the vaccine. You know, the vaccine has been viewed as sort of the silver bullet that will shut down the pandemic. There's two, two major problems, right? For the vaccine to be effective, we've got to achieve herd immunity. To achieve herd immunity, you've got to have 60 to 70% of your population immune. If 40% of the people in America in the most recent poll surveyed are unwilling to get vaccinated at this point, until safety is proven, we will not achieve herd immunity for a while. So we've got to distribute the vaccines. And more importantly, people have to take them. 
And we see that even with the flu vaccine, people don't normally take it. The other problem is effectiveness, right? We hear about 95% effectiveness. Most people you know, hear that and they think, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Well, let's be a little bit pragmatic here. 330 million people, if all 330 million people in America were vaccinated, 5% will still be susceptible. Shouldn't be a big deal, it's only 5%. 5% of 330 million is unfortunately 16.5 million people. It's still a very large number. It is not inconsequential. So, you know, through the course of the pandemic, we believe collectively that the vaccine will have some benefit, no question. We just don't know for how long that immunity persists. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that antibodies decay after about four months. We've seen that in multiple, multiple different studies. The vaccine itself, in terms of the populations that have been uh, given the vaccine in the clinical trials, unfortunately, we don't have six months or one year of experience about efficacy of this particular vaccine. So we literally are faced with, we can't get enough vaccine out We've got to triage and figure out who it is that gets it first. And of the people who you know, are able to get it, people need to be willing to take it. And last but not least, we don't know about the long-term efficacy or side effects. That's the challenge. I wanna be very clear, vaccine, 120 companies working on a vaccine four different very strong candidates uh, you know, in Europe and the United States. Uh, we just heard that in the last couple of days, the very first gentleman in uh, the UK received his, his dose of vaccine in, outside of a clinical trial. So this is a great start. It is important, it is amazing, but there are a lot of unknowns. It is not going to be the silver bullet that shuts down this pandemic. Here's the other incredible problem. We are a company that relies, not a company, I'm sorry, a country that relies on international travel and trade. We have porous borders. Unlike New Zealand, we are not going to shut down all of our borders and completely shut off any kind of international trade. It simply won't happen. Even in New Zealand, they started having, uh, you know, recurring cases because of infected imported seafood. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that we're out of the woods here for at least 18 to 24 months, even with the vaccine. There's a lot of distribution as well as adoption challenges that we're seeing. That's the, you know, I'll say the mixed bag. Um, the interesting thing is that the regulatory environment has absolutely changed. The FDA typically takes obviously two to four years in order to approve drugs or vaccines, that sort of thing. Um, they've been very, very, very good about what we call emergency use authorization, where they say, look, show us some evidence of safety, show us some evidence of effectiveness and we'll go ahead and abbreviate it and we'll do an emergency use authorization if it's related to COVID. And that's what's been going on. The question becomes, which are the treatments that will stand the test of scientific rigor after the, this next wave of the crisis? So if you're going to look at investment, you know, you've, you've got to look at, you know, what is it that's going to stand up well beyond this initial wave of therapeutic and diagnostic technologies. I think that the biggest opportunity for uh, drugs to get into the marketplace rapidly are the repurposed drugs. So as an example, uh, hydroxychloroquine it is something that was used for malaria, something that's used for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, when there was early suggestion that it was useful, it was considered a repurposed drug for COVID-19. Repurposing existing drugs, they've already been tested for safety. They have another indication of some kind. 
And frankly, uh, in the current environment, given the limited window of two to three years for this particular storm, if you will, repurposing of a drug gives far greater return at significantly lower risk. That's the way that uh, we've looked at this particular market. One particular drug that's very, very interesting, it's one called favipiravir. Angelo, try pronouncing that three times quickly, right? Um, this is a generic drug, it became generic in 2019. The uh, licensing rights uh, had previously been owned by Fujifilm Toyoma Chemical. So Fujifilm has a, a subsidiary that produces pharmaceuticals called FFTC, Fujifilm Toyoma Chemical. This drug was a broad or is a broad spectrum antiviral. It, it knocks out an enzyme that the virus needs to reproduce. That's what it does. I can use all these fancy terms. It's an RNA polymerase inhibitor. It you know, causes this, it does this, it does that. At the end of the day, you know how they always say it's a viral infection, there's no treatment? That's not entirely true. For influenza, Tamiflu or Oseltamivir is an effective treatment. Zofluza is another effective treatment for what is a virus. This particular drug was proven to be effective against H1N1 influenza and was approved in Japan in 2015 for the, that very indication. However, someone in Wuhan actually said, hey, let's try this out on COVID-19. So they did a small trial early in the pandemic and discovered that it was actually pretty effective. Other trials took place in Russia as well as India. And they discovered, hey, this is actually effective. Fujifilm Toyoma Chemical went uh, forward with a trial early in the year to look at effectiveness for COVID-19 in Japan. For the first phase or the first trial, they didn't have enough patients uh, in the trial, so it didn't reach statistical significance. Then in September of this year, a follow-on trial clearly reached statistical significance in reducing the duration of illness with COVID-19 using this drug. So they've approached the Japanese FDA specifically for an indication, and that'll wind its way through. Uh, the pragmatic reality is that because this is a generic, there's no intellectual property. It becomes who can produce this and get approval in relevant countries as quickly as possible. There are a whole host of manufacturers. Uh, unfortunately, there's about a 40 to one demand versus supply for this particular drug around the world. It is presently approved for use for the treatment of COVID-19 in 30 countries, not in the United States yet because there are ongoing clinical trials. So bottom line, if we look at the background, you know, you've got remdesivir, the IV drug, which is a $2,300 per patient drug. This particular drug, favipiravir, is an oral drug. And clinical trials are ongoing. We have a very interesting opportunity for the actual uh, use of this particular drug for prophylaxis. So I want to make sure that you know everyone's on the same page. This is a, a, a drug that can actually be used for people, adults of household contacts of someone who is positive. So think about that for a moment. If what you're trying to do is shut down the pandemic and you've got a group of people who are not comfortable with the vaccination, many people are comfortable with a 14 day oral drug treatment if in fact it is safe and most importantly, this is the most important piece, it reduces the period of being infectious. So if you can identify these people who are positive, have them quarantined, start on the, on the drug itself, 
their quarantine is abbreviated for a certain period of time. Most importantly, they stop being infectious in anywhere between four and seven days. This is huge to shutting down a pandemic worldwide. This is, is really, really an incredibly big deal. So, you know, we look at this as something that has the ability to dramatically impact the tra trajectory of the pandemic. There are a number of challenges with the drug. One in particular is that uh, there is very, very little safety data in children throughout the world. Very, very little safety data in children. It is not usable in uh, women who are pregnant and individuals who have either gout or liver problems should not take the drug. That's a minority of the population, however. So we just view this as an incredible opportunity, both on the international markets, where there is not significant FDA regulatory requirements that, that you, know, you have to jump through, uh, but certainly in the United States as well. So that, that's what we've got at this point. We're uh, proceeding with an IND trial and IND approval, which is investigational new drug trial uh, for this particular drug. And we've got collaboration from a number of, of very interesting, well-established academic medical centers uh, for participation in this. So let's look at, you know, potentially what the market is for this. It's very, very simple. In the US alone, 2 million cases a month, even achieving 10% of that is a pretty substantial number. And in Latin America, 4 million cases on a monthly basis, looking at an achievable, easily achievable, less than 10% market share. So we have a number of different mechanisms which we're looking at in terms of the distribution. And, you know, at this point, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and we can talk about that for interested parties. I'd like to just pause right here and turn it over uh, back to Angelo in the audience in terms of uh, questions because you know this is an update on COVID-19 and obviously we we have a number of different opportunities that we can certainly talk about uh, offline but I'd just like to open it up for questions to make this as effective as possible for the audience that is graciously listening to us today. Angela? Yes, we are very kind, doctor. That was very concise and fantastic from both an update perspective as well as, again, Family offices are often investors in opportunity. Uh, there was one or two questions that came in, and I have some questions for you. But one person sent me a text that they will have to leave shortly, and maybe others may have to as well, which reminds me, for those that do have an interest in following up with you or your team from an investing perspective, how could they do so? Uh, we... So we have our investor relations uh, contact here, uh, Ms. Dee Dee Lee, and uh, we're happy to provide the uh, investment details. Uh, it's in the form of a, a convertible note. There's a, a you know, a, a return and a profit share component. So uh, Dee Dee Lee, we'll, we'll be happy to share that contact information with the participants. Great. What I would recommend, and I believe DD is on the call. DD, if you could type in for those that are live, uh, your contact info, which I'm assuming would simply be your email. And then maybe at the end of our interview, for those that hear this in a video and cannot see the chat feature, uh, we could mention that or even I could do that out loud. So if you're on or if Dr. Sanjay Patel could do it, we'll make sure to add your email into the chat feature. And on that, perfect. You you beat me to the punch. So those that are live, it's right there. And those that aren't, it is D D spelled D E E D E E. So twice D E E D E E dot Lee spelled L E at Accelera E X C E L E R A Health dot com. On to the questions. So and they're going to go all over the place from me. Uh, I'll start with the FDA here in the United States. So the Moderna and the Pfizer in the UK and other parts of the world is approved. They're probably ballpark, maybe a three weeks head start. 
we all learned why, well, the FDA is the FDA, and they bring up some decent points. Let's put this in a public hearing, let everyone hear about it, let's do a deeper diligence. But you could argue that three weeks is still three weeks. Do you think the FDA made the right decision here in the US or they could have got it out a little faster? So I have to say that the FDA, uh, in not only during this pandemic, but of late, it has manifest incredible, incredible flexibility. Keep in mind the FDA's responsibility is to ensure that what is sold to the public for a particular treatment or prevention or indication is safe. That is their, their paramount consideration. That is their responsibility. If I'm running the FDA, I absolutely, this is not a you know cover yourself sort of thing. I truly believe that the FDA has a fundamental responsibility to ensure the safety of certainly these treatments. Remember, this has really been fast-tracked, right? Normally, this would take one to two years of actual safety and efficacy study. So I honestly believe that they're doing the right thing, not, not just being curmudgeons or anything like that. And this truly has moved at warp speed. There is no question whatsoever. So hats off to the FDA. And I'm gonna uh, ask you my follow-up questions related or unrelated. I do encourage the live audience. We have some sharp investors specifically on the phone. Feel free to ask questions via the chat feature, which I'll read out. Uh, I'll ask the next two, which may be a little uncomfortable, and if the answer is none of my business or you have no opinion, I completely understand. Will, relative to what we see now with Moderna and Pfizer, will you personally, if it's available to you, take one of those vaccines? Probably later in the year. I will, but later in the year. By later in the year, you mean 2021? Oh yeah, yeah. Wh which means other vaccines will likely, and we hope, be approved. Uh, a little bit of a question that could be a little uncomfortable, but if you had to make a strategic decision now from what you know about Moderna's vaccine and Pfizer, which one would you take at the moment? I have insufficient evidence to really make a decision, which is why I would, again, I'm just, this is not a medical opinion. This is me personally looking at the safety of my family. There's just not enough evidence out there as to side effects or, uh, contraindications. We're seeing now early reports that people who've had severe allergic reactions perhaps are not good candidates for this vaccine. That just came out in the last few days. You know, I I can tell you I have family members. I, well, I have, make no secret about it. I keep an EpiPen around. I'm allergic to a number of things, particularly bee stings and the like. Uh, so it really becomes a question of we need to get much more information about this because we need to ensure that this is going to confer immunity or some form of protection beyond three months. That's the reason I'm, I'm talking about later in 2021. I just would like to see what the safety data looks like at a larger scale than say, you know, 60, 80, 100,000 people. That's, that's really what it boils down to. And I'm being very, very open about that, both as a clinician, a scientist and a husband and father. Of course. And in looking at the logistics of producing so many vaccines, and right now with the current two, and this may adapt, I understand, with others, you need it several months apart. So really, here in the US, that'll be approximately 600 million plus doses. What's a realistic time frame, which we probably really don't know, for mass production? And let's even be generous and say 70% of the population wants to get it. Would best case be by the end of next year? I'd say it's uh, probably the middle of, of the following year. You're looking at 18 months from now is your, your best case. That's your best case. Because widespread availability will be in late spring, early summer. And then you've got to undertake the gargantuan task of vaccinating potentially 300 million people, right? You've got to right. get them all to do it. And not everyone will move with, you know, the same temerity and, and velocity that is needed. So 
Uh, I think there are going to be challenges. And here's the other crazy part. This is the most important piece, right? Just because you get the vaccine out there, you're still going to have international travel occurring. You're still going to have cases out there in the community that you're fighting. So on the one hand, you know, I look at the vaccine as you're creating a perimeter. You're, you're, you know, either chopping down trees ahead of a forest fire, but you're still dealing with the forest fire. So it's, it's quite a, it's going to be quite an interesting challenge. In addition to that, you're going to have people who say, well, you know, I either, I don't want to take the vaccine. I don't believe in the vaccine or I've already had COVID or, you know, there, there's so much out there. There's so much out there. So I'd like to get some evidence that this confers immunity beyond three to six months. There's an entirely a possibility. I mean, let's take a step back. Why has there not been a vaccination for coronavirus prior to this? Why is there not a virus for an, a whole host of RNA viruses out there? Look at the HIV uh, you know, infection piece. There's no vaccination. They've tried and tried and tried. That's a pretty big problem worldwide, has been for more than 30 years. So I'd just like to get some more evidence. I'm not being a curmudgeon or a skeptic. I just need to get more information before I have that put into you know, my kids. That's, that's where I'm coming from, but that's just my opinion. And assuming that I get the vaccine, and let's even assume specific to me, it works. Okay, so I'm going to be resistant to getting COVID-19, but I'm assuming, or am I wrong? I could still be a carrier. So those that have not been vaccinated yet, although I may be fine, again, we're going to make that assumption, uh, but could I still pass it on or it doesn't even exist on me at all if I get the vaccine? So theoretically, if you are vaccinated and you uh, develop immunity, then you are, if you are exposed, ultimately infected, your immune system will combat that pretty rapidly. If there are neutralizing antibodies that are induced, then your immune system will combat that pretty quickly and reduce your ability to spread that to anyone else. So the short answer is, if you get vaccinated and the vaccine is effective in you, which it appears to be 90 to 95% at three months, then you, you likely will not spread it to other people. The big question that many have in this, in virology and infectious disease is, will there be durable immunity beyond three to four months? Because we're seeing that you know, there is quite a bit of uh, antibody decay. The antibody levels plummet within four months. We saw that in the UK public studies. So, you know, the, the jury's out. That's the problem. We just don't know. It could be like the flu vaccine in that, you know, different strains start coming out. The virus has already mutated several times. There's just a lot that we just don't have enough insight on. What role will messenger RNA play in COVID-19 vaccines? I think that uh, messenger RNA and that entire technology is the reason that they were able to create these vaccines as rapidly as they could. Unfortunately, it is a double-edged sword. So taking a you know, small fragile RNA fragment, you've got to have uh, you know, specialized freezers for the storage and the distribution of this. Um, you've got a number of other types of vaccines that were developed outside of, you know, say the Moderna, the Pfizer's, the et cetera, the world. They had a different strategy and they seem to be effective and not as susceptible to the fragility of the storage and the transport requirements. So short answer, um, you know, messenger RNA made it possible very rapidly. If you actually read the story of how quickly they, they sequence the, uh, the, the virus and then develop the fragments, it is nothing short of amazing. It's just a question of, is it going to be durable in the long term? So messenger RNA as a technology, it's 
incredible. This is the, the true litmus test of it. And I suppose I asked it in a different format later, but I'll reposition it. Hopefully it's still a viable question. Uh, and maybe not making it over scientific, but a very brief summary from your perspective. What are the advantages and disadvantages of the different vaccines from Moderna to Pfizer? Too early to say. Straight up, too early to say. Just way too early to say. No one really can definitively state. Um, you know, you can argue complication rates and you know, uh, adverse effects and that sort of thing. It's, it's just way too early to say. I think that anybody who touts one over the other without compelling scientific data to back it, uh, it's, it's very, very slick marketing. I <laughs> <wouldn't>... <laughs> uh, what role did data play into targeting COVID antibodies? So, you know, COVID antibodies, that's another piece that if you look at uh, immune globulin and, you know, that, that whole line of treatment, in my mind, it is not something that is a scalable model for treatment. In order to have antibodies available and immune globulin available, you've got to have a lot of people who are a, infected, and B, contribute, right? They donate, they get paid for their, their sample donation, uh, and then you've got to basically go through the entire process of separating those out and then distributing them. So I think it's a stopgap in the critically ill, but it, I just don't see it as a scalable model. But in terms of the data piece, it's somewhat limited. It's, it's really who's positive, let's approach them, Let's do some testing. If they've got neutralizing antibodies, let's go ahead and, and proceed with that. We're getting a question in from the audience. It is, please ask him for whom he has secured investment so far. Let me slightly position that question, reposition it, because obviously we don't want names, but is it fellow successful professionals in the medical field? Is it ultra high net worth investors, family offices, small institutions? Who has shown interest and has been active so far? Yep. So up until this point, it has been relatively small uh, in terms of high net worths uh, and others in the clinical arena. They're not necessarily um, physicians. They are people who are in healthcare and understand how this works, how this can be manifest. There's quite a bit of uh, interest now. I mean, we have a, a number of conversations with institutionals at this moment in time. But transparently, have we signed an institutional at this moment? The answer is no. Um, what we are looking to do, and again, we can certainly go through it in, in greater detail, the drug itself, production at scale, we're looking at a, an exclusive distribution right for a specific dose form in the United States. That's the key. It is, it is literally an exclusive distribution arrangement through a uh, established manufacturer that is able to produce this at scale. So it's effectively get the license to go ahead and distribute and then it's a distribution channel. That's what it boils down to. And I guess a quasi-related question coming up also from one of our participants, and I do believe in the presentation you did answer this, but for those that might have missed it, we'll re-ask it from the question here. What is the size of the market space of the drug that Accelera Health is supporting? Yeah, so um, I'll just give you some, you know, round numbers, right? So we know that when the pandemic had been blunted to some extent, late summer, right? You were looking at about 70,000 new cases per day. So 70,000 new cases times 30, you can do that math. Pretty straightforward, right? A couple million cases every month. If we were to hit literally only 5%, we're not even talking about a prophylactic, we're just talking about documented new cases. You already exceed 100,000 cases per month. What is the overall size? 
This looks to be with a prophylaxis indication, right? Let's say I get COVID-19, I have three people in my household, uh, you know, they get the drug prophylactically, I get it therapeutically. You're looking at three to four times the number of actual documented cases. So when we look at the size of the market in the United States, you're looking at between two and three million. And then people come back and then the, the argument is, well, with a vaccine, that's going to go down, isn't it? I'll just present the following. 330 million people get vaccinated, 95% efficient. Let's assume everyone got vaccinated. You've still got 5% of 330 million that will contract the disease. It's more than 16 million people. So, you know, in terms of the size of the market, I think that this is a two-year window and you're looking at anywhere between 10 and, well, in terms of the size for this particular drug in the United States, anywhere between 40 and 50 million on the conservative side in terms of number of cases and just work downwards from there. This is a pretty substantial market uh, in terms of achievable. If you look at Mexico and Latin America, you need to roughly triple those numbers. Yes, and that was part of your presentation when you did mention that. Uh, what role will machine learning play into the future of, well, many different things? You did mention can cancers earlier, so oncology, and generally things we're even talking about today. So uh, not related to COVID-19 or, uh, you know. You could go maybe in both directions if you want. Yeah. So I think that uh, machine learning, it remains to be seen. Uh, it'll, it'll probably help in identifying in people who have specific biomarkers, specific genetic characteristics. Uh, when you do a, a whole genome sequence, let's say that you take a population of 1,000 people who have COVID-19. And let's say that 10% of them had severe illness. Uh, there was a percentage of them that had no symptoms whatsoever. And there was a percentage that had mild to moderate symptoms. If you risk stratify for age, you're going to find a lot of interesting characteristics that are well beyond race and ethnicity. There will be specific genetic biomarkers that determine who does well, who doesn't do well. And I think that's where machine learning, looking at the human genome, is going to be applicable for COVID-19. Machine learning uh, in the same way, looking at predilection, predicting disease, predicting cancer, and also looking at uh, mutational tumor mutational burden. That's where I see me, uh, machine learning being relevant. Frankly, that's why we created Discovery Genomics in the first place, mm -hmm. one of our subs subsidiaries. So it was created ostensibly for that purpose, right? Take a population that has chronic illness as well as acute illness, and a small percentage of them have cancer as well. Look at the tumor genome, look at the human genome, and apply machine learning on that in order to better elucidate what's going on with that population, what predicts disease. That's That was remains beyond COVID, our, our business model, our value proposition. Well, it's a good question then. And reminds me, I guess, and pardon if it's a little off, but from what you just said, I don't think it is. What is your view uh, on CRISPR, Cas9, gene editing technologies? <laughs> So I think about, oh, five years ago, uh, there was a uh, presentation at South by Southwest. And the statement was that uh, genomics will change the planet more than the internet. And part and parcel of that is the data and machine learning on the human genome, but also on CRISPR-Cas9 in terms of what it can do in terms of inherited disease as well as other types of illness. So CRISPR-Cas9, again, double-edged sword, it can be used for great, great advances in the science and treatment. It can also be used to create some very bad things as well. CRISPR-Cas9 will be almost uh, as dramatic as the invention of you know, the computer chip. It'll be, it'll be revolutionary in terms of how it's applied and what will come of it. 
yeah, we're going to have to save a deeper dive into that at a point in the future. Uh, I wanted to be more specific. We got a little off course, but mainly on COVID and opportunities for treatment, which you were very succinct on. It's been a pleasure to see you again. I'm glad you're staying healthy to have you on and know that you're you know, actively a participant doing some wonderful things during these challenging times. We did mention earlier for those that are uh, qualified and wanted to reach out and learn more, DD Lee at accelerahealth.com. And I will remind everyone that because there was some level of investment discussion today, uh, that this is really meant for people that would be qualified to make an investment in such a situation, that's one, and that you need to do your own diligence. This is simply for education, for a little bit of entertainment purposes, and investing is a serious business. You and your professionals should understand your time horizons, your risk tolerance, your part of your investment policy statement, your asset allocation uh, a profile, and where potentially biotech and opportunities like this may or may not fit in. Very simply, you need to do your own diligence. This is simply for educational purposes. And these videos are evergreen. Someone may watch this in 10 years, and I could guarantee you things will be completely different, hopefully much better then. Uh, we shall see, you never know. Again, black swans, like arguably what we're seeing now with COVID uh, could change things and unfortunately be not so good of a future, but let's try to be a little positive. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Patel, it's been tremendous to have you on. I look forward to the next time. Enjoy the holiday season and talk to you next year. Thank you so much and happy holidays to everyone uh, who participated. Take care. Thank you.